Now we've already done some work on the experiment to measure the acceleration due to gravity by the free fall method. And the first thing we did when we approached this topic was to derive this formula here. For an object falling freely under gravity and no other force, we said the acceleration it's under, the acceleration due to gravity, is 2s over t squared, where s is the distance the object falls, and t is the time taken to fall that distance. So by measuring the distance something falls, and the time it takes to fall that distance, we can actually calculate the acceleration due to gravity very, very easily. Now looking at a way to actually implement this formula, or use this formula, well, this is the traditional setup. There's the metal ball that falls, there's the electronic timer that times how long it takes to fall through that certain distance s, which is measured with a meter stick. <coughs> you measure the time, you square it, you measure the distance, you double it, you throw everything into that formula, and the acceleration due to gravity g pops out from that formula. We um, also noted that there was another way of calculating g, the acceleration due to gravity using this experiment, and that was by drawing this graph here. <coughs> now this graph has twice the distance, s on the y-axis, and t squared, in seconds squared, on the x-axis. And we noted that because the formula was in this shape, with, with we, the graph was in this shape with uh, 2s on the y-axis, what's on top of the line on the y-axis, what's under the line, the t squared on the x-axis, then automatically, if you plot that graph and get its slope with the traditional slope formula, the slope will be g. If any time you have an expression, a formula, and you plot what's on the top on the y-axis and what's on the bottom on the x-axis, automatically, the slope of the graph will be whatever that is, which in this case is g, the acceleration due to gravity. And it's this we're going to be looking at today. <coughs> okay, what else did we do? Well, we looked at, as we do with all experiments, some precautions to make the final result more accurate. And there's a whole set of precautions here to make the final result more accurate. Some of them actually are repeated there, but that's okay. That's not a problem. We also looked at a couple of ways of minimizing air resistance in this experiment and make sure you note them because they have come up in exams over the years. Uh, another thing that often comes up in an exam is explain clearly how the time was measured. Well, you press the button, the ball falls, the timer starts, the ball hits the vibration pad, the timer stops, and you note the time on the timer. And then we looked at a sample set of results. Now, these results actually came from a fifth year class some years ago and they dropped the ball from different distances. They record the time on the timer in seconds. <clears throat> and what I would expect you to do now is for each set of data, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sets of data, to double the distance, that's a very easy part, to square the time, that's reasonably easy as well, and then perform the calculation 2s over t squared, to calculate the acceleration due to gravity for each of the seven sets of data. Now, it might be a good idea to actually look at a more interesting data table. Now, this is the exact same data, the exact same results, only I filled in the table a little bit more. <coughs> okay, we have S, the distance the ball falls in meters, time, the time on the electronic timer in seconds that the ball falls. And what I've done is I filled in the different uh, columns. Um, 2s, I've just doubled in each case. Time squared, I just put that into the calculator and squared it. <coughs> um, ignore the little, um, the, the, the figures in blue for the moment. And what would I expect each student to do now? Well, I expect each of you to go 2s divided by t squared, because 2s over t squared is a way of calculating the acceleration to gravity. And when I divided 0.6 by 0 0.0596, I got 10.07, and that's my value for acceleration due to gravity for the first set of data. And I went through all of that process for each of the seven sets of data. <coughs> that's easy enough. You don't have to look at this. I wouldn't take this down. I would actually perform your own calculations there yourself. You're well able to do that. What I got was an average value for g, the acceleration due to gravity of 9.88 meters per second per second. And I think that really is in very good agreement with the 
standard accepted value on the Earth's surface of 9.81 meters per second to the minus 2. So the error between those two is very, 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 very small. And at different points of the Earth's surface, you can get a slightly different value depending on how far you are away from the, uh, the center of gravity of the Earth, a slightly different value for G. <coughs> so that's the first thing I would do. I would take these results down in your experiment copy. I would put in the five uh, columns. I would then, starting with that set of data, work out the 2s, work out the t squared, and then work out 2s divided by t squared, which is g, the acceleration due to gravity. <coughs> that isn't a very difficult thing to do. I've done a very interesting thing here, too, that you might be interested in. It's more a third-level thing, but there's no problem. I worked out the percentage error in my, my work, and the percentage error is the reading, the, sorry, the result that we calculated minus the accepted value for the acceleration due to gravity, over the accepted value, and I multiplied by 100 to bring it to percentage. So that turned out to be 0 0.07 divided by the real value, my error divided by the real value, multiplied by 100 to bring the percentage. I think that works out at less than 1%. So that is a very, very, very good result any which way you look at it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, something else that you might be interested in, and I think you could write this into your experiment copy, because it has come up twice in the leaving cert in the last 10 years or so. Why is it usually more accurate to do calculations from a graph rather than just doing it from a formula? Well, if you plot a graph, the first thing is it's easier to identify things we call outliers. And outliers are points on the graph that just don't fit in with the trend. There's some error or some mistake has been made and those points don't fit into a trend. I mean, if you had something like this, if you had a graph like this, and no matter what's on the axis, and your points are there, nice straight line, and suddenly you get a point away up there, well, you would have to question, is that the reality of the situation? Is that really telling you something, or was an error made? That point would be known as an outlier. Second thing for um, advantage of graphs, a graph will allow you to get an average over a larger number of values. When you get the slope of a graph, you're not just using those individual points, you're using all the points on the, the line. Third thing, why is a graph a very good idea? Using a graph, it is easier to observe trends and patterns to see thing, if things are proportional, directly proportional, inversely proportional, to see what kind of relationship are between the two sets of results that you have plotted. I would actually ask you to take that down into your experiment copy and write a little note on that because it has come up a few times recently in the Leaving Cert. And of course, the last thing we're going to do, the last thing I want you to do is actually plot the graph. Now, what you would plot is 2s on the x-axis and t squared on the y-axis. A lot of people ask me, why do you plot that? Why would you do that? Well, it's very, very simple. If our formula is acceleration due to gravity is 2s over t squared, and we want to plot a graph that is to allow us to calculate the acceleration due to gravity by using the slope, then have what's on top of the line on the y-axis, have what's on the bottom of the formula on the x-axis, and that will imply that the slope of the graph will equal g, the acceleration due to gravity. It's the same for any other formula. If you put what's on the top on the y-axis and on the bottom what's on the x-axis, the slope of the graph will be whatever is on the left in the formula. Okay, so I took two s values and the t-squared values and I plotted them on graph paper. Now, here is what I got. And I appreciate that the way the camera is angled, you might not be able to see all of this, but I will also um, scan it and put it up on files for you. Well, the first thing I did was if I put down a heading, a graph of 2s against t squared to measure acceleration due to gravity. That's good. No marks for that in an exam, but it's good to have it there. Second thing is vital. I've labeled my axis 2s, twice the distance in meters, and if you can see it down here, the time squared for the ball to fall in seconds squared. I looked at my data there, and I said the 2s's go up to 1.8, and the t squareds go up to 176. So I kind of said 180 is the next kind of step, nice step up there. And I use that information 
to plot my graph. Now, you are very, very good as a class at plotting graphs, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Although, what I did was I plotted my graphs, even with my bad eyesight. I think I got them in correct order, correct forms, correct places. And when you put the point down, preferably in pencil, but I use bars so you could see it, you ring them in, a little red ring like that, and that looks really, really, really neat and really cool. I would also, even though it's not one of your data points, I would ring not not the origin to make absolutely sure that you put your graph through that point. And what I'm going to do now is a thing that some people find a little difficult, and you might see a little difficult to actually see what I'm doing, but I'm going to get my transparent ruler, and I'm going to put my transparent ruler at the origin. I'm going to pivot it there at the origin where the two um, axes meet, and I'm going to try to draw a line of best fit. Now, a line of best fit doesn't have to go through all the points, and clearly the data points will not always be a perfectly straight line. There are reasons for that. It's not that the universe is telling us something. It is that there are limits to our experimental techniques. Okay, so we're going to find the line of best fit. Now, I'm going to just Keep the um, origin there. Keep the uh, ruler pivoting at the origin. Come down. Now, there's seven points, so I'm going to keep going down till I get three points above the ruler, or above this edge of the ruler. Okay. One, two, three, and I'm kind of going through one point there. Now, there's you have to make a judgment on this, and there's quite a lot of leniency in the Leaving Sardana's paper for this, thankfully, and I've drawn my line, hopefully, of best fit. Now, let's just do a little bit of work on this. Well, I've got one point on the line, just one point on the line. I've got one, two, three, one, two, three points above the line, and one, two, three points below. So I've got one on it, three above, three below. Yeah, to me, that's a line of very, very, very good fit. Now I'm going to do some calculations. Well, the kind of calculation I'm going to do, and I hope you can read this because I appreciate when my hand goes in here that the focusing will go all over the place, but that's just life. Uh, to calculate the slope. And I'm going to start writing down formulas. The first thing I know, g equals 2s over t squared. And then I also know the formula for slope of a line is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, what am I going to do next? Well, now I'm going, to, I'm going to identify two points. Well, here is one beautiful point down there. That is my point not not, which I call x1, x1, and y1. Okay, now I'm going to take another point. I'm going to take a point as far up as possible and... That optician was right. I do need glasses eventually. I'm going to take that point there. And I am thinking that that point is come down there. It is, oh. Now it would be a very good time to tell you something. And I almost forgot. So please forgive me. And I could go back and actually do this video again. But I couldn't be bothered. So I'm going to have to tell you something. Look at those points, that, those, there, those t squares. Those values look appallingly difficult to actually plot on a graph, don't they? So what have I actually done? I've just multiplied each of those values by one, two, three powers of 10, a thousand. I've just multiplied each value by a thousand. Now, instead of plotting point zero five nine six on a graph, I'm gonna plot 59.6. Instead of plotting, 0.1376 on a graph, I'm going to plot 137.6. Okay, so why am I doing that? Well, the numbers in blue are a lot easier to plot than the numbers in black. Of course, when I do my calculations, I have to remember that and reverse it back. But it gives me a not easier way of plotting the, the graph. So now I've got to get a point on my graph. So what I'm going to do is take this point up here, which I'm calling come down there, and I appreciate you might be able to see it, that's 160, and go across, and that is 1.6. But hang on a sec, it is not 160, it can't be 160, because remember, as I said, to help me plot the graph, I multiplied all the t-squared values by 1,000, so I now I divide by 1,000, that number is 0 0.160, and that's going to be my x2, y2. 
So now I'm going to write down the two points that I'm using here, 0, 0 and 0, 0 0.160 and 1.6. Again, this is my x1, y1. This is my x2, y2. You might have different ways of, of calculating the slope of a graph, but effectively it's all right down to the same thing. Now I'm going to say m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 equals y2, 0, y2, sorry, 1.6, y2 minus y1, 0, over 0 0.160 minus x2, x, x1, sorry, 0. That turns out to be 1.6 over 0 0.160, which I will, just for the sake of it, use a calculator, but I think we can safely know that that is going to be exactly 10. So the slope of my graph turns out to be 10 meters seconds minus two because it is acceleration. We said the slope of a graph is 2s over t squared, which is g, the acceleration due to gravity. So I've got my answer there for g, 10.0. Now I'm a little disappointed with that, only a little disappointed. I would have hoped it would mean a little, little bit better than my calculated value of 9.88. Because generally, when you get the slope of a graph, it works out as a more accurate answer because you're, you've, you're talking about more points. But I won't complain with that answer either. So what I'm hoping you will do now is you will, first of all, write that data uh, result sheet into your experiment copies. You'll calculate each 2s, each t squared, 2s over t squared to calculate g, get an average value for g, the acceleration due to gravity. That's okay. Then plot that graph. If you don't have graph paper, you might be surprised. The postman might bring you a present in the morning. And you will plot the graph and do those calculations there. Um, I will leave the camera hover over that so you can actually see what calculations I actually did. I hope that was of some use to you. Thank you very much.